Raymond. Hey, good morning, good morning. How's it going, man? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, okay, yep, yep, yep. You ready to get started? Yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool, hair looks great. <laughs> so, I'm, having, I'm having this COVID hair now. Right. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm doing the same thing with my hair while I'm waiting in here uh, to get started. <laughs> Uh, just so for context, um, go ahead and state your credentials, who you are, what you do, and uh, you know, just uh, just for anybody that's going to listen to this in the future. All right. So yeah, um, I am Raymond Narag. I am an associate uh, professor uh, at the um, um, Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice um, School of uh, Justice and Public Safety here at uh, Southern Illinois University. Um, I finished my um, PhD at Michigan State. Uh, I came here in the United States uh, way back in 2005 as a Fulbright scholar, and I did my master's and PhD uh, here, and now I'm a professor here at SIU. Awesome. So while I was doing some research and trying to figure out a little bit more about you, um, I came across a nice little tactic that you used. You said that uh, your favorite way to start a conversation is by asking about people's sports teams. And I was wondering, do you still do that? Is that something that uh, you still do? And um, where'd you come up with that? Oh, here uh, in the United States? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I, uh, I um, chimed upon that while I was teaching at uh, Michigan State. And um, my way of uh, teaching is usually to start a small talk, you know, um, yeah. and at that point. And I realized that, you know, students in the United States, at least during the time at Michigan State, uh, they are into football and basketball. Right. At first, um, football, I'm very alien to that sport. I don't even know. <laughs> it's a tough about. sport. It's a lot of rules. <laughs> so I, I, I still learn rules and I've been watching it my entire life. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> why, why, why is it uh, allowed this way, but not this way, right? Right, so, yeah. It yeah. seems like they come up with <clears throat> another new obscure rule almost every year, too. That's right. That's I'm assuming right. you're a Michigan State fan. That's. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm a big Spartan fan, uh, football and basketball. Well, me and my family grew up rooting for the Wolverines. So. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That's where, uh, that's where my dad's side of the family is from. Uh, it's okay. Uh, it's a healthy competition. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, sometimes very, uh, what do you call this, acrimonious. Sometimes they fight really, really. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so do you still watch sports and keep up with stuff um, in the sports world? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. College. Usually college. College. Uh, yeah, yeah. And sometimes the NBA. Uh, okay. Yeah, if my, my if my team is doing good, uh, right. I'm still a I'm still a Detroit Pistons fan, but oh. I'm a I'm a tortured fan right now. <laughs> well, that's all right, man. I'm a Chicago Bulls fan, and we're kind of in oh. the same boat. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So, what what's your take on COVID in the sports world? Ah, oh, it's unfortunate, you know. Yeah. Um, they have suspended it in the Big Ten, and I do believe that all other conferences will follow suit. Yeah. Uh, because it's not it's not really really um, workable right now. They put right. some athletes, and then these athletes are starting to get infected. Um, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. I think I think just like everybody, player safety and just everybody's safety in general should be top of mind, and you should do nothing without being cognizant of that first. That is very correct. You yeah. Know, uh, you know, it, it brings a lot of uh, revenue to the universities. It brings a lot of action to students. Right. But you cannot compromise uh, our player safety and even the students' safety when they go there watching. Right. You know. Yeah. So. I mean, if you're if you're detrimental to your students' health, that's that's going to be way more of a financial burden in the future than and if you just did it the right way. That is very correct. That's yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I'm still hoping the spring uh, sports will continue because uh, our uh, Spartan basketball team should be primed again yeah, for I a good a, run. I heard a lot of them are trying to do maybe football in the fall, which I wouldn't have a problem with at all. Football for the spring. I mean, uh, the spring, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's correct. That's correct. So, 
uh, we'll see. Uh, I don't know about SIU. I haven't heard uh, of any plans yet in the Missouri Valley either. Conference. So, yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Unfortunate, yeah. All right. Well, you have one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard. And I can't <laughs> believe we went seven weeks in innovation and we knew nothing about you or your story and your struggle. And whenever me and Deb were talking about it, when we heard you do your pitch finally, it, we were just kind of blown away. Like we have this guy with this incredible story and he's the superstar over in the Philippines. <laughs> nobody's, nobody's heard this before. So you're, you're really the inspiration for us wanting to start oh, thank this. You. And, uh, and I just want to give you a second to, you know, kind of go through your story and all the details and kind of what got you in this place. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, go ahead and share. So, yeah, um, if I'm going to start with my personal history, so I would go back probably uh, 20, 25 years earlier in my life. Uh, when I was a college student, I was about to graduate from the University of the Philippines, which is the number one university in the Philippines. It's like our sort of Harvard, we say. Yeah. And, and they are in the top, you know, 500 in the world university ranking. So it's not, a pretty, it's not pretty bad for a developing country to have that uh, world ranking recognized, right? And um, I was in the top of my, you know, uh, education. I was about to graduate uh, with honors cum laude. And I was about to um, go to law school and start so what my... So what did you study before? I did, did you still study criminology? No, 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 no. There's no criminology in the Philippines. Criminal justice. Really? Yeah, no criminal justice program in the Philippines. That's, that kind of makes sense now. But That's right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I did public administration, and my goal really is to become a lawyer and to be a good, shrewd lawyer, right. making, making a lot of money. Right, and, the uh, stickler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I want, my, my vision was uh, when I do my, um, when I am done with law school, I go back to my home province and start my political career. Then yeah. I'll run for mayor, run for congressman, then senator, then the, president of the republic of the philippines <laughs> yeah so you have all these dreams going forward and uh that's right that's yeah. right but um uh, immediately before my graduation a, a few months a few months before my graduation as you say there was this uh, incident that happened in up diliman campus um where a group of men were having lunch and suddenly they were attacked by masked men with bonnets and uh ski masks covering their faces and they whack these victims uh, eating while eating. And many of the victims ran, uh, except for one who, uh, is, uh, who, who tripped because there's a protruding root of a tree nearby. And so he uh, lay down there. And the attackers, they could not uh, attack the other people who ran away. And so they uh, singled, singled up on this you know, poor, poor guy. And they uh, started whacking him in the body, in the head, and such. And uh, immediately after, they ran away. And then the police came because there's a campus police, and they interviewed the witnesses and also the other victims who ran away. And all were one in saying that they were not able to attack who the uh, I, I, I identify who the attackers were because uh, they were all wearing masks, ski masks, bonnets and they were running for their own dear lives. And it happened in, a, you know, probably 15, 20 seconds. That's what they say. So it's happened really fast. Right. And then immediately after they were brought to the infirmary and the doctors asked the same thing, uh, who the attackers were. And all were one in saying that they, don't, they did not know who the attackers were. And uh, unfortunately, two days after, that person died. Yeah. Did, and, did you ever figure out why they were attacked? Um, it was a fraternity-related violence. The fraternity-related violence. Okay. Yes. In the Philippines, we have fraternities. You know, uh, okay. Americans, they colonized the Philippines in the early 1900s. And right. they introduced that in our educational system. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. So, so we, we, yeah, yeah. We, just, we follow the same fraternity call, uh, culture here. Uh, yeah. But, but we have more violent 
uh, fraternity rights in the Philippines called uh, hazing and initiations. Right. We have that here as too. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily that serious, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, in the Philippines, they, they hit you in the pulp, you know, and uh, many people die of hazing in, in, the, in the universities. And once you are a member of the fraternity, it's like a tribe because Filipinos are very tribal and yeah. becomes a tribe. Right. And they would see other fraternities to be the enemy mm -hmm. because they compete uh, against, against each other for recruitment. So the best student they would get and they would compete against. And then they would engage in what they call rumble. They fight each other. Right. Were you in one of these fraternities? And I was one in that fraternities. You were one in that fraternity? I was one as a member of a fraternity, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was a member of a fraternity, right? Yeah. And then it happened that the victim's fraternity suspected my fraternity to be the ones involved. Okay, and you guys had no involvement at all. No, no, I, I was not involved at all. Right. Okay, so continue with the story. And so um, they went to the police after four days. And after, we call it the National Bureau of Investigation. It's patterned after the FBI. Right. And... Um, uh, the NBI <clears throat> happens to be uh, the brother, the fraternity brother, we call them brads, of one um, of, the, uh, of the fraternity that was um, attacked. Mm -hmm. and in so the they knew someone in there. Yes. And in oh. the Philippines, it's all about connections. Right. So they are connected to the NBI. And when they brought the witnesses and the victims to the NBI, <clears throat> the NBI coached them. <clears throat> on what to say. Wow. And they said that in the heat of the attack, the attacker's mask fell off. And when the attacker's mask fell off, they saw the name of, uh, they saw the face of Raymond Naran. Did his mask ever fall off at all? Other witnesses said, no. The nurse, how would Bonnet fall off their face? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's what I'm trying to figure out. So they were coached by... They were coached by someone they knew in the MBI to say that and to say yeah. that it was your name. How did they come up with your name specifically? So what happened was that, um, you know, if you're a frat member, you spy on other fraternities. And yeah. it happened that um, in 1992, two years before the incident, um, it happened that uh, uh, we live in a dorm. We stayed in a dorm. Uh, all for third, uh, some of our fraternity members stay in a dorm. I was second year college during the time. Yeah. And they got a list of the people who stayed in that dorm who are our fraternity members. Yeah. And that same list was that the list that they gave to the NBI to be the attackers. Oh, jeez. And some of those already graduated from the university because that was two years ago. So he's already in Singapore during the time working. Another one transferred in another UP campus because you have UP Diliman, you have UP Las Banos and other campuses and yeah. many others. So all of those were dropped in the list of uh, so-called attackers. Right. And unfortunately, I was one of those because I was a resident of that dormitory uh, two years prior, and that's what they that that's where they got the release. Just wrong place, wrong time. That is correct. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, they dropped my name there. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so yeah, because of that, I was accused of murder, two counts of frustrated murder, and three counts of attempted murder. That's a lot. I was, yeah, three. Yeah, uh, and that's for death penalty during the time. Yeah. Because uh, we have death penalty for murder. And I was 20 years old. I was about to graduate. What's and the, that must be devastating for a 20-year-old to, to be accused of this and you, you weren't even there. That is very correct. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's more devastating for my parents because they have very for high sure. expectations for me. Right. You're and, on this path. You have all these dreams. You want to be a lawyer and then be a public, mm -hmm. public official. And... Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden you're getting hit with two counts of frustrated murder and three counts of attempted murder. Like, mm -hmm. what, what is, what's your mindset like as a 20-year-old at that point? And you, and, you, and you have all these dreams and it just gets cut short by something that is completely unrelated to what you were doing and you weren't even there. 
Well, uh, at first, uh, I really didn't pay attention to it because I knew I was innocent. I knew I'm innocent. I know that I could easily be uh, declared innocent. That was my um, naive belief. And I, I, I was 20 years old. I was very playful, you know. Yeah. And uh, I told myself, because I was an activist, I was a progressive student. Right. Um, uh, I, I, I would, you know, organize students for rallies. I would uh, educate um, fishermen and farmers uh, in their communities in order to learn more about political issues. So you've yes. always been a go-getter. Yeah, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a leader. Yeah, right. I, I'm a student council leader. And uh, I told myself that, okay, so if they are going to put me in jail, then I'm going to uh, view it as a long-term immersion low budgeted, but I'm going to understand what afflicts the ills of Philippine society. Right. So that was what my, my mindset coming in, that I'm going to learn from this experience. That's, I mean, I mean, that's so commendable because a lot of 20 year olds, they would just sit there and complain like, oh man, why is this happening to me? Why does this have to be me? Instead, you're putting yourself in like, how do I make the most out of the situation I'm in instead of trying to change the situation itself? Which I mean, like sometimes we have no control over what happens to us. So like, that's, that's like, that's super commendable. Cause I don't think at 20 years old, I would necessarily have that mindset. <laughs> well, I actually uh, experienced that same thing as well because our lawyers promised that we'll be out in six months. Right. But then after nine months, we are still there. And after nine months, our bail was denied. Wow. Our motion for bail was denied. And initially, there were 11 of us who came in the jail because I have what they call co-accused. And nine of them were bailed out. Oh, so that's, there's only two of you left. There were only two of us left. And that's what, whoa, now this is not a game anymore. Yeah. This is real. What if I'm going to be in jail for 20 years, one, uh, 50 years? What, will I be, what if I'll be given a death penalty? And that's when, whoa, it's, it's no longer a game. And I could now see how depressed my parents are. And that's where I had all those questions and doubts. You know, why am I here? And, you know, um, I questioned my faith because um, before that, I was not a believer. You know, I didn't believe in, in God, I would say now, you know, and um, th that's where, you know, I have to rethink through uh, what's happening into my life. Yeah. And uh, I, I went, underwent that bout of depression. I have a girlfriend coming in, uh, in, in jail and I have to let her go, you know, because I don't want her dragged in the sorry mess that I was in, I told her. But... Eventually, uh, there were people inside the jail, especially uh, a nun, a Catholic nun, who told me uh, uh, to whom God had given much, much is expected. And I said, yeah. oh, wh what do you mean by that? Okay. And she said, okay, come and help me. And that's when I really, really uh, tried, tried helping my fellow inmates. Because if I will be here in jail for a long time, what productive things should I do while I was in I'm inside? Wow. And so there, there I started a literacy class program. You started uh, I, a program. Oh, yeah, 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 a literacy class program. Um, I organized my fellow inmates who know how to read and write, who are college graduates. And then uh, we identified inmates who do not know how to read and write. Oh, and okay. And then we asked the warden to give us a space in the jail. And yeah. we, called, we called it the Functional Literacy Class Program. And every morning I would go and teach in that classroom. So you're actually teaching people that don't know how to read and write in your jail while you are waiting out your trial. And we're going trial. Yes. Yeah. And they started calling me Teacher Raymond. That's awesome. That's right. And yeah. um, we, we communicated with the Department of Education. Uh, and then they gave us a, a volunteer teacher. And um, they recognized our program. Really? And it became part of the Bureau of Non-Formal Education. So you and have an authentic program while you're still in jail, 
teaching these inmates how to read and write and you're accredited. Yes. And wow. when I got released, uh, they used my uh, Crescent City Jail functional, functional Literacy Class program as a template for creating the ALS, the Alternative Learning System. Wow. In and now all jails nationwide have an ALS. That was patterned after my program when I was an inmate. So you began this work of the correcting the, the penal system while you're still in jail as an inmate. Yes. That's, that's amazing, man. Oh man, that's like, only this, one. What of a the story things. of just being so proactive and like <laughs> just taking your situation as it is and trying to make the best out of it. Oh, that's only one of the things I did. There's one. There's many more. The one. The one thing more is uh, I introduced the paralegal system, the inmate paralegal system, because when I was in jail and I started uh, following up cases. Uh, I discovered that many inmates stay in jail for five years, 10 years, even 20 years. They are still unconvicted. Wow. And, and so what so I did- just for context, that means no sentences has been given out. They're just still awaiting their trial. They're undergoing trial. Because wow. in the Philippines, trials are piecemeal. You have a hearing now. Three months after, you have another hearing. Three months after, you have another hearing. Sometimes one year, sometimes two years. And if the judge gets promoted and there's no new judge, then you could have uh, a lull in your, in your hearing for, say, two years or three years. So, because, oh, sorry, go ahead. Because it takes a while for new judges to come. And so if you add all of those, some inmates can stay in jail for 20 years undergoing trial because of all the postponements. That's crazy. So just for context, Tell everybody how many years you, you were in prison for. In total, I stayed in jail for six years, nine months, and four days to be exact. So almost seven years. Seven years. And you're completely unconvicted at that point. You're just waiting for trial. Undergoing trial. Because Undergoing I'm, trial. So. Trial, yeah. yeah. Because it's different in America. Right. So pre-trial is very long, around two months, three months. And, but once you have your trial, it's boom, boom, boom. It's one, it's one day or two days or one week at the most. Right. In the Philippines, pre-trial is short, but it's our trial process that's very long because right. it's new. And do you think that's like a cultural thing? Is that just the way they do it? Or is it like a lack of infrastructure over there that they don't necessarily have like we do here in the United States? It's three reasons. It's structural, lack of infrastructure, organizational, lack of uh, coordination among the different, and cultural, because they do it purposely, because they make money out of it. Oh, okay. Yes. I didn't know that. We'll talk about yeah. that for a second. How exactly are they making money out of it? So if you're a defense lawyer, you are paid every time you make an appearance in court. Oh, okay. And the more postponements, the more chances for you to uh, have fees from the accused or the d defendant. Oh, it's money grab. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unlike here in America, you pay a lawyer uh, up front. Right, it's a flat fee. It's a flat fee. And yeah. then however it long it takes, you know, it's right. the same amount that you pay. So, so for lawyers in America, it's better to keep the trial short right. so that you could move more cases. In the Philippines, right. it's better for the trials to belong because you make money for each of the appearances you make. Right. Okay. And so you've, you decided once you came out, you're going to make this your life's work. Did you immediately have that conclusion while you're in jail? Like, you know, I'm, I'm going to find a solution to this problem. Even when I was in jail, I was trying right. to find solution already to the different problems. And actually, that was my prayer. Because uh, uh, when I was denied bail, uh, I, I had a prayer, you know, and said, Lord, if you deny bail, I'm going to be productive here. But now since I've been productive over since throughout my time, now that's my promulgation, Lord, please uh, release me so that I will tell everything, everyone, of the things I have seen inside the jail. And I'm and going to improve. The that's situation. what kept you going, your faith that you know, one day I will get through this and I'm going to be able to share my story and, and be able to do some good in this world. That is very correct. But even when I was there, since I know I'll be released, right? Uh, it's just a matter of time. So I'm going to 
uh, document everything that I've seen. So I did a journal when I was in jail. I interviewed my fellow uh, PDLs, we call them now, uh, persons deprived of liberty. I interviewed uh, jail officers, you know? Really? I also, yeah, even the jail officers, I have friends with them. Um, you're doing a lot, man. You're, you're really not sitting around just waiting for, for your hearing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I did the paralegal. I trained inmates to become paralegal volunteers inside. Wow. So that they will monitor how long an inmate had stayed in jail. And I also volunteered in the records office of the jail because in the Philippines, they lack personnel, right? right. And in the Philippines, if they knew you're a college graduate, they will incorporate you into their uh, what we call trustee system. Mm -hmm. So I became a trusted inmate. I am the one who type in calendar hearing every week, every day. Yeah. And so I have access to the files of all the other inmates in their records files. <laughs> I could as, a, as an inmate. As an inmate. That's and crazy. I was the one who, who, who made uh, an organization to their file. Wow. Because I was a public ad graduate. So, so I, 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 I alphabetized it. So and you're I, the records keeper of the jail while you're still an inmate. And you, I, and you completely got yourself into this position kind of on your own. I created their alpha list. That's crazy. <laughs> you know the Excel file? They yeah. Know yeah. So I, I'm very good at Excel. So I could compute length of stay, uh, who are the judges who are delayed, who are the judges that have a lot of postponement. <laughs> I, I did all that. And I, I, I teach them how to use it. The jail officers. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I, I, I trained them. I even <laughs> trained the warden. Because oh, the, the warden? warden? Time, oh, yeah. Because I've stayed in jail for so long already, right? Right. And the warden come and go. Yeah. Uh, they stay in jail for one year or two years and they are transferred or they do some corrupt activities and, and they get booted out of office. And the whole time they have no problem giving you oversight and autonomy over, you know, this whole system you got set up. Like, how do they feel about, okay, we're going to let this inmate keep track of our records and stuff while he's, you know, in well, the I, of I, trial. I, I'm very careful not to upset any of them. Right. I know my place. I don't want to go overboard it because I know that my uh, privileged position is borrowed position. They could just remove me out of that anytime they like. Right. But the other thing is, so I became a paralegal coordinator and then a uh, teacher. On my fourth year of stay, uh, I became the mayor de mayores of the Quezon City Jail. It means to say mayor of all the mayors because uh, each cell has a mayor. And then all these mayors has an organization, we call it the Capit Basic Uniting Arms, and I became the mini city mayor, the mayor de mayores. Oh, okay. And so I handled the four warring gangs during the time, the Sputnik, Commando, Bala, Batang City Jail, and they are different uh, gangs, inmate gangs. Yeah. But in the Philippines, uh, gangsters are very developmental. They are not uh, against the government. Unlike here in America, gangs here are uh, pain, pain in the, in the ass of the uh, jail officers. In the Philippines, gangs are very helpful to jail administration. Yeah. And so what happens is that I became an inmate leader. Now I have political power. And newly arrived wardens, because they don't know the culture of this jail, I would be the one to inform them about the jail culture. Huh. This is how we do things here. <laughs> if, he, if he doesn't conform to the jail culture, he will be booted out of office. That's how powerful I became. That's so crazy to me to think that you had all this, this say and kind of leadership while you're still an inmate there just because you're the one facilitating the procedures and the systems like that and and you're you're still in the middle of your trial and you're telling new wardens that when they come in like this is how the system works this is how it's done you're like coaching them like informally, this informally yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right yeah. how to become an effective warden this is what you do yes that's crazy yeah. man so yes. talk about uh, talk a little bit about the conditions uh what did, what did that look like while you were there um because i'm sure they're quite a bit different and you've said before that they're they're nothing really like the jails here in the United States. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem is uh, it's very overcrowded. That right. jail that I was in was designed for 286 
uh, inmates. When I arrived, there were 700 inmates. So almost, and, more than three times the. And when I year. left, and when I left, there were 3,200 inmates. 3,000? Wow. Yes. So 3,200 inmates for so, 286. What, so what does that look like having 3,000 inmates in a jail that's designed for 200 something? That's right. So imagine one of the uh, dorm rooms in SIU, right? It's yeah, I've lived in one of them. They're tiny. That's right. They're very <laughs> tiny. There will be around 50 to 100 inmates staying in that jail, in that room. In that room? That's crazy. So they would be, yeah, so that's why we need to create what we call tarima or kobol. So they would uh, come up with little structures to add up. And so people will stay there on top of each other and they will stay on the floor and then others will stay outside of the cell already. Right. And they would sleep in the basketball court, for example. Mm -hmm. And so there's practically no way of putting the inmates back to their cells during daytime, uh, during sleeping time. Yeah. They are part of the cell, but they actually could not be accommodated in the cell. So they are living outside of the cells. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure living that close quarters with everybody, um, you know, frustration swells, like people, people get tense. Well, that's the key difference. Um, I would say that our cells, despite the overcrowding, is much more livable and peaceful than American cells. Really? Why is that? Because in America, you might be staying in one cell for yourself, but you have mental issues, mental problems. Right. Um, because you could not communicate. Um, um, it's very tense in America because of violence. Do you, you, know, think, that, you think that's a cultural thing? Yeah, it's a very cultural here in America because there's tensions between African-American inmates and Caucasian inmates, etc. And there right. will be guns. And uh, in America, uh, everything is done by the, by the staff, by the government. Right. Um, there's no inmate leader in America that's recognized. Right. In, in the jail, so imagine in a cell designed for 10, there will be around 50 to 100. There will be a, an inmate leader, a set of leaders. There's the mayor, vice mayor, bastonero, culturero, etc. And everybody has a function. You are the ones in charge of cleaning. You are in charge of uh, doing this, etc. And there's what we call a VIP system where inmates with food and money, they are sharing this money and food to other inmates. It's required. Really? That's right. So uh, you, the cell becomes a community of sorts. Right. And they, so, they are, sorry, go ahead. And they help each other. And there are rules that govern the cell. If one inmate gets sick, everybody is going to contribute for his upkeep. Right. So you think this accountability system that you have over in the Philippines is a lot more advantageous this, um, that with the, all the accountability and everybody looking out and doing their part within inmates is a lot more effective to, let's say, a system over here in the United States where it's basically the government and the staff running everything, doing everything. And That's right. So, for example, if an, an, an inmate in America, I could never teach my fellow inmates here. They will right. never allow me to do that. They will never allow me to go to the record section and use my computer skills. Yeah, no, they that would just, be a big no. The big no, no. They yeah. will just put me in my cell and try to reform me. Right. And, we, of course, if I'm not really a criminal, I don't need any reformation. I was not a criminal at all. I was right. falsely accused of a crime. Yeah, it takes about your ability to be productive. So they should make, maximize me. In right. America, I, I could not be maximized. Here. I'll just be an inmate because everything yeah. will be done by the personnel. In the Philippines, because of lack of personnel and lack of resources, they maximize me. And yeah. they do that not because it's part of their manual, but it's because of coping mechanisms. It's an informal system. Yeah. Because in the Philippines, they copy everything in America, from America. So the manual of running a prison in, a, in America is the same manual of running a prison in the Philippines. But the situation is very different. Right. In America, the uh, ratio of personal to inmate is almost one is to three. 
So Sometimes at most your race once compared to every other race. There is no, the per the personnel to inmate. So oh, one personnel, personnel to inmate, right? Uh, one personnel uh, supervises three inmates in America. Wow. In the Philippines, one personnel supervises eighty inmates. Eighty inmates. That's. Sometimes it could go as high as five hundred. I mean, how do you look after 80 inmates if you're one person? <laughs> That's why you need the, we call now shared governance. In my research, I call it shared governance. You shared governance with inmate leaders. Right. And okay. that's, that's, that makes the system workable in the Philippines. And it has good benefits. Right. You know, um, if, if, you, if I bring, if, when I brought my students from America, and my colleagues from America, and we visit jails in the Philippines, they are amazed. Yeah. Oh, Raymond, why would this system not collapse? If this happens in America, everything will break loose. Yeah. So you get out of jail, you finally, you finally are acquitted. What, talk about some of the work you're doing now, and, uh, and what, what are you particularly focused on in the prison system? I know you work over in the Philippines quite a bit. You're a consultant. And now you're doing some online courses to help them out. So talk about that a little bit. Okay, so um, because of the things that I've discovered, uh, there are two main areas that uh, I do a lot of research. One is uh, jail and prison management. And mm -hmm. one is on prolonged trial detention. And they are interrelated, but uh, the audience are quite different. Uh, for the prison and jail management, it's more about uh, correction officers, jail officers, and probation. For the prolonged trial detention, it's much more about the judges, the prosecutors, and the defense lawyers. Okay? And sometimes, even the jail officers are included there as well. Right. So, for the jail management, okay, so given that they have this situation, right? Lack of personnel, lack of resources, lack of space, uh, in the Philippines, we develop what, we, what I call now the um, uh, alternative coping mechanisms. So they have the Mayores system, the VIP system, the Kubol system, which is creating your own structures, where it has good and bad effects. The good effect is that uh, inmates are empowered, inmates could be reformed, you know, mm -hmm. they participate. You protect their pre-prison characteristics uh, yeah. in jail that you prepare them for their eventual release. So if you're a teacher outside, you could be a teacher inside. And still, yeah. you could be a teacher after your release. If you're a lawyer outside, you could be a lawyer inside. And then you could be a lawyer when you're released. Right. Having said that, not all is perfect. There right. are a lot of things that um, have negative consequences. For example, um, because of the uh, capacity of the inmates to bring money, there could be drug trade inside, right. drug use inside. Yeah. And because of that, personnel could be um, co-opted and they could be corrupted. And right. because of that, gangs could flourish and then they become very powerful and they will now run the joint yeah. instead of the jail management. Right. And those happen similar to what's happening in Latin American prisons. Okay. So um, I've documented all of these and I've been searching for ways on how to introduce Western theories of correctional management and tailor it to Philippine realities. Mm -hmm. And so I developed this course called Principles of Effective Correctional Management. Principles of Effectional Correctional Management. Principles of Effective Correctional Management. And what does the course entail? And uh, I teach them how to view uh, classification of inmates. So first, you need to classify and risk assess the inmates based on the principles of R and R, risk, needs, and responsivity, right. so that you could identify what are the reasons why he was put in jail in the first place. Right. Why did he use drugs? Why did he uh, became a thief? Why did he became a sex offender? Right? Mm -hmm. Because all of these are factors that have biological, psychological, and social uh, causes. And so I'm teaching them how to do risk assessments. That's one. And when they're done as a risk assessment, then they need to have the second component, which is housing placement, housing assignment. 
they need to be put in different uh, security levels, minimum, medium, and maximum. Again, that's based on Western principles. Right. But in the Philippines right now, as I have told you, since there are gangs, it's based on gang uh, classification. If you're a Sputnik, right. you will be in the Sputnik cell. Commando, you'll be in commando cell. And these are all so, gangs in the Philippines. And these are all gangs in the Philippines. So right. if you're a first-time offender, you could be housed with a veteran offender. Right. And so I told them that's the reason why there's contamination yeah. within ourselves. And so I'm teaching now the principles of housing placement. It's alien to them. They don't know what housing placement is. They just put them there. Yeah. And so I strategize like, you know, program-based housing. Like, for example, if you're an ALS, the one that I, I created, the literacy program now is being introduced in all jails. So if inmates are coming in and they need education, then they could be put in what we call ALS center. That becomes a cell. Yeah. Okay, so I'm teaching them those principles. And then the third one is uh, principles of effective programming based on the notion that you need to address the, co the cause of offending. So, for example, if he's a drug user and drug dependent, then there should be a drug program inside the jail. And so I'm teaching them different programs right now, you know, uh, how to address a sex offenders problem, how to address a problem with mental uh, health issues, how to address problems when inmates have uh, family problems, fear problems, all those, the, the big A. Yeah. And what I do is I look at American best practices, okay, for example, change, uh, thinking for change or yeah. the, the cognitive behavioral therapies. And I try to get the principles first, the theory behind it, and then tweak it, reformulate it, and make it compatible with Filipino culture. Right. Filipino and are you culture. allowing inmates in the jail to be a part of the teaching as well? That's right. And I incorporate oh, okay. shared governance in it. That's awesome, man. That's that, right. That, that seems like it has so many benefits that are just counterintuitive. Instead of locking these guys up and, you know, throwing away the key and not giving them any kind of autonomy or freedom, you're, they give them a sense of purpose and meaning while they're still That there. is correct. Yeah. And now that's my contribution to America. Yeah. I'm challenging America's belief that inmates should not be incorporated in their own reformation programs. Right. That's why in America, we have very high recidivism rate. Yeah. Recidivism rate in America is 60 to 80%. Yeah. In the Philippines, our recidivism rate is 20 to 30%, way lower. Wow, that's huge. That's huge, huge. Yeah. It's simply because of my own personal experience. Yeah. If I'm an inmate here in America, I will definitely be a very, very hardened criminal here. Yeah. It it's will be it's like, almost like they're throwing them in there and they're like forming a criminal while they're in jail instead of trying to go through and reform them. That is very correct. Because yeah. they will never use my talents here in America. Whereas in the Philippines, the first thing that they ask is what are your skills and talents that we could use yeah. while you are in jail? And you have this how, how can you maximize therapy you? and all this knowledge. Yeah. So, for example, uh, in, in my training, so we identify the risk levels, right? Mm -hmm. And so we could identify who are the inmates that have very low risk. People with good education, with good family background, with good um, um, employment, but made uh, a big error, like driving and getting drunk and killing someone. Now you are in jail. Right? You're right. not a criminal, you know? Yeah. You, you did a bad uh, judgment. Made a mistake. But, yeah. Made a mistake, but you're yeah. not a criminal. And mm. so what should you do while you are in jail? Right. So That's if a you're a question. teacher, so if you're a teacher, I want you to teach inside the facility. Yeah. And so what I do is I teach the jail wardens, the custodial officers and rehabilitation officers about these principles of effective programming and whoever graduates from those programming as the uh, inmate will become part of the uh, implementers in the next batch. Right. So the inmates can now implement the same program that they underwent in succeeding batches. We call it peer mentors program. That's awesome. That's so cool. So and then, I have a... and, then, 
And then finally, the fourth component is documentation and assessment. Because yeah. that's what's missing in the Philippines. You don't document. Right. There's no uh, record skipping. And so I teach them how to record. So if they underwent a training program, you need to have everything is in Excel file right now. And that's my struggle. I want to develop a software right. eventually to do all of these things. And that's why I need the software programmers uh, to be my partner so that they could develop this into uh, integrated uh, data management system from classification to housing to programming and proper documentation. Yeah, that would be the next step in your business for sure. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that seems like a fantastic idea. Um, so throughout your entire journey, you just go on and on about all the things you learn and staying proactive. What has education meant for you, not only in the um, higher education system here at universities, but also just self-education and continuously learning throughout your life? Could you, could you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, uh, for for me, um, experience is the best teacher, right? Yeah. Uh, but you also need to document. You need to uh, capture and make sure that it is written. So yeah. that's what I did. Uh, when I was in jail, I kept uh, a diary, a, a journal, and tried to capture everything that I see, hear, sense, um, and make my uh, reflections every now and then. Yeah, journaling, and is, I, journaling is so powerful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, that's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Do you still journal to this day? And if so, what, what kind of are you focusing on? What do you want to capture down on paper? Is it just your thoughts and feelings? Is it your goals that you have to get done that day? Um, could you kind of walk us through that? Yeah, all of those, uh, whatever I could feel right now. So for example, yesterday in my Facebook page, I, uh, I uh, have this hashtag detained but not contained. And okay, I, I like yeah, that, I'm gonna steal that actually. Yeah, yeah, detained but not contained. If you could search that, that's my hashtag right now. And I would capture, uh, because I have uh, a picture, I have a set of pictures, right? I would visit the pictures mm -hmm. uh, in jail and then uh, try to relieve it. And once I get the feeling, I get the, my, my emotions back, I close my eyes and then pretend that I am in that picture. And then I could easily go back uh, to my old files or sometimes even to the deep recesses of my mind. And I capture that and then I write it there. Right. Okay, so for example, the word buryom or boredom in the Philippines. Yeah. Uh, how is it to feel that you are bored? You know, what are the reasons why you are born in jail? And so I yeah. would capture that and then put it in my post, uh, in, in my Facebook wall. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I also um, document all my training programs. Mm -hmm. So this is what I thought. This is the contents of what um, the module was. These are the participants. These were their reactions. And then my hashtag there is uh, walang tutulong sa Filipino kundi kapwa Filipino. No one will help a Filipino but a fellow Filipino. Yeah. And th 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 that captures my, my, my uh, training programs. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I have my own personal reflections like uh, the joys of being a teacher. Yeah. Uh, and then I would, uh, you know, uh, tell my struggles about teaching here in SIU, uh, especially the context of uh, racism, etc., and all of this. Uh, how does it affect me? How it affects my teaching philosophy and yeah. my my uh, eagerness to become a better professor, something like that. Yeah. So all of those I uh, incorporate uh, in my um, in my because now there's blogging, so I would put that into my Facebook blog. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's one of the most advantageous things I've ever done for myself, just waking up in the morning and getting thoughts and feelings on paper, just trying to cultivate that emotional intelligence and awareness that, you know, this is my reality and this is how I feel about it. Like it, it just opens up a perspective of, you know, what, what, is, what can I do about this moving forward? Yes, yes, yes. And that, that's one reflection. But what really helped me as well is my formal education. 
uh, yeah. when I stayed, I studied my master's and PhD because in the Philippines, when I was in jail, I have this wealth of what they call now ethnographic data, right? Yeah. So I interviewed uh, so many people. However, I don't have the frame of analysis. It's like uh, chapsui. We call it chapsui, or it's a, a, a type of food or a vegetable yeah. where you bring them together and then cola, that's it. Right. But when I was in Michigan State, and I was introduced to criminological theories. Oh, I didn't know there were theories to explain all of this. <laughs> right. it's, like, it's like the idea, and this is the practical application. I know the practical application, but I, know, I do not know the idea behind it. Right. So it's a second layer of understanding. And once I got exposed to the ideas, oh, there's social learning theory, there's criminal, all these theories, it even, uh, broaden my my um, horizons by thinking. Now I know why I could relate one program to this program and this yeah. program to that program because I know the theory behind it. Yeah. And that's what's missing in, in the Philippine uh, correctional uh, officers. They know what's happening in the field, but they don't know the, the why are these things happening. And the third most important is research. Because I was trained in Michigan State and now here at SI to do very rigorous research. You know, how, to, how do you interview? How do you use theory to guide your interview questions? How do I analyze data? Yes. What's the dependent and independent variable? Because if you know this, wherever you go in the Philippines, uh, maybe the judge, the court's office, or the prosecutor's office, I would ask them, give me your data and I'm going to show you how to analyze it. Right. Because they have the data, they collect data, but they don't know how to analyze it. Mm -hmm. And so this, they don't know how to analyze it. They don't know how to produce policy implications from the data. Yeah. And so for me, that's the, uh, the, the learning that I've learned, you know, uh, things that really helped me uh, in my advocacy. So personal experience, my, uh, my um, journaling, plus this formal education, and then I put them all together. Right, and you connect the dots. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So uh, another thing, I was watching your TED Talk. I didn't realize you had a TED Talk as well. You have a TED Talk, <laughs> which is cool. Um, you said that you wrote letters quite frequently while you're in jail. Do you still write letters to people? Um, uh, physically, right now, no. I don't uh, email them. Uh, I don't send them mails anymore. Yeah. But I do write through uh, Facebook Messenger or by emails now. Right. And people that I'm communicating now more are the uh, prison officers and jail officers. Yeah. Uh, and also some inmates who have been released. And some inmates I've been partnering for programs. Really? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's there awesome. are, yeah, uh, a former inmate who's a lawyer, a uh, lawyer, he got released, now he's uh, still a lawyer, and we are doing this community bail bond together. So walk through that, what, what is that exactly? Okay, so I launched this program very recently, Community Bail Bond. Community Bail Bond. Yeah, and we have a website now, www.preso, P-R-E-S-O, CBB, Community Bail Bond, CBB.org. Okay. And the idea here is, since so many inmates are languishing in jail, not because they are guilty, but simply because they could not bail out. Yeah. So uh, there could be people with bail as low as uh, $20 or $40, and they stay in jail for one year. Yeah. And what I did was, okay, it's useless, you know, helping them inside the jail if you could not release them. Yeah. And it's useless to talk to the lawyers because of the prolonged trial hearings. So what if we just bail them out? It's $20 for God's sake. Anyway, that money will return back to you when the case is over. Yeah. So what I did was I wrote a Facebook page uh, pleading to my friends to donate money and we are going to bail out people. But of course, no one will listen if you don't 
donate your own money first. Right. And so yeah. I have to plead with my wife to donate money. So yeah. I donated one month's salary for that program. That's awesome, man. And then I sent it to our program partners called the Presso Incorporated. And now we started bailing out these individuals and so many people now, I raised probably $2,000 now, That's okay, awesome. uh, for that program. No, 2,500, I would say. Okay. And for people listening, if you if you if they wanted to donate to this organization, where would they go to do that? Oh, they could donate to the um, Community Bail Band uh, Foundation, uh, okay. Press Foundation. Okay. I don't I, I don't handle the money; it goes directly to the Philippines. Gotcha. Cool. That's right. And so, what happens is that um, we talk to the wardens, whom I train. We talk to the paralegal officers, whom I train to the power lawyers whom I train, that if they have no anyone who have bailable offenses, but low risk, okay? I, 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 low I risk, have to right. Low Gotta risk. add that in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't want to bail out rapists for now. Right. Uh, if <laughs> they are not. actual rapists, right, right, yeah. right. But if they are bailable, and they've been staying in jail for so long a time, refer that to our program. But it has three components. First, we need to offer programs while they are in jail. Uh -huh. So I developed this uh, program called Mapagpalayang Kaisipan, uh, Freedom of the Mind. It's a community-based, uh, cognitive-based therapy program, and it could be administered online. And so what I did also is what I solicited computers among my friends and donated it to the jail. And the computers, it has internet in it. I have to pay for internet connection as well. And the inmate will talk to our volunteer, okay, to have this Mapagpalayan Kaisipan program. So one-on-one -on -one counseling. That's awesome. And, and while doing that, we apply for bail. We, we talk to the judge, we talk to the defense lawyer. And here we realize there are so many steps to do. You have to have a picture ID of the inmate. You need to go to their address and make sure that they are actually having a home address. Talk to the parents, talk to the barangay leaders, village. So we all, we all do that. And um, we have volunteers to do that. And yeah. once they are bailed out, we monitor them a fund release. Make sure that they attend court hearings. Yeah. And we refer them to a partner organization called El Providores. Okay, the providers, and the El Providores provide livelihood assistance to these uh, released inmates. Yeah. And we also partnered with another uh, religious organization called ISAIA uh, uh, 611, and they provide spiritual services. And so there are three things. While in jail, we do counseling, bail them out, and then when they are released, we do monitoring and referrals. So it's a holistic program. Yeah. And right now, we have uh, bailed out a uh, total of uh, 13 inmates now and dismissed the cases of probably around 12 more. So we have 25 release participants now. That's a great and start. Yeah, yeah. yeah 25 release with... participants. Uh, it started because of the pandemic. And then we are processing probably around 60 more coming. So this is brand new, like it just started during the pandemic. May, May 9th, uh, 2020. That's, That's awesome, right. man, that you've already, you've already taken the first step and now the dominant oh, yeah. is falling into place. And so, that's, the, that's the reason why I'm offering these training programs. That's why I try to learn from you guys how to yeah. commercialize my programs so that the money I make will be used for community bail bond programs. Well, you're already on your way, man. Just be as proactive as possible and try to learn as much about your your market and the the people that you're helping as much as possible. And you you already do that in spades. So I have no doubt that you're gonna you're gonna be one of our success stories to come out of the innovation and you already are. So I, yeah, go ahead. That's why I created this slogan. Nakapag aral ka na, nakapag palaya ka pa. Uh, you already learned. You also help in freeing another person. Yeah. So that's the slogan, and that's because powerful. you said, because you said that you have to capture it uh, in a way that will uh, resonate with the participants. So, and uh, 
uh, for now I for because I did the training for free in the first batch uh, on September 1st to October 1st I offering the second batch and 46 signed up nice and Great. I don't know and the way I'm going to deliver it is the same way that you and dad uh, deliver it yeah the last time so there's, that's what I'm going to do yeah there's something about doing it for free and adding that value up front people just feel so more compelled to listen and to buy into what you're saying at later dates. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. That's absolutely amazing. And all the work you're doing, it's amazing, man. I can't say how privileged I am to <laughs> be able to teach you something as much as you are teaching me about what it is that you do. And you're truly an inspiration to all of us. Yeah. And that's the reason why I'm very open to these uh, seminars. When, when you guys op uh, offer this seminar for free, whoa, this is amazing. And I went through all the modules. And it's like, because I don't know anything about business at all. <laughs> well, I mean, like it's stories like yours <laughs> is like what, what makes it worth it for us, man. Like, oh, the, okay. like just very like good. hearing your story, it's like, wow, I get to work with someone that's doing some amazing work throughout the world. And, you know, it's, it's humbling. It's thank you, really thank great. You, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So it's going on an hour and we, I know we both have things to do. <laughs> um, so I want to ask you one thing and we'll, we'll leave off with this. What advice could you give to someone that's maybe going through something that, you know, they're losing hope or something external has happened to them about keeping their faith and keeping themselves motivated and to keep, keep the grind up and keep going. Yeah, uh, for me, I live by uh, some sayings that I developed when I was in jail. Um, first is, ang tunay na ginto kikinang kahit saan. A true gold will shine wherever they may be. Okay, a true gold shines. So um, for me, when I was in jail, I knew I was in that such you know bad place. But if I am truly a gold, then I will shine even if I am in this bad place. Yeah. So that that's what I was always thinking, you know, um, and and it and it and it guided me. So um, sometimes there are challenges in our lives, some because out of our own doing, or sometimes it's imposed by us by other people. But that should not define us. Rather, um, what defines us should be how we responded to that situation. Absolutely. And my second saying, it's very similar to that, is no one can put a good man down, okay, or a good person down. Yeah. And as long as you are doing the right thing, uh, you are, um, you know, courteous to everyone, you know how to place yourself in your situation under the sun, and that's what we call in the Philippines, alamin mo ang yung lugar sa ilalim ng araw, know your place under the sun. And, um, you grow from there. Uh, you grow where you are planted. Okay, the Bible says that grow where you are planted. And so I do believe that these are just challenges that are given to us, and there's a reason for everything. Yeah. And try to understand what those reasons are. And eventually, uh, down the road, you will look back and say, Ah, now I know the reasons why I was put in that situation. Yeah, that's what it was all for. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, man. Yep, thank yep, you. Yep, thank yep. you so much for coming on and sharing your story. You're all right, all right, truly yeah. an inspiration to all of us. I, I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, and I'm very thankful because what I did now, so I created this um, uh, startup group now called yep. the Global Justice Reform Initiative. Okay. And uh, I'm looking for partners uh, who could uh, be my co-teachers, okay, mm -hmm. and someone who will manage our website. Okay. And um, I found the Thinkific. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with Thinkific. It's a learning management system. Where oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, yeah. We could, where we could upload all our training modules mm -hmm. and participants could enroll. So hopefully it works out. It finds out. Awesome. So anybody listening to this that want to be a part of whatever you got going on, maybe they just want to connect or something like that, where did they find you online? How did they get in touch? Um, for now, I have a very active Facebook page. Okay. Uh, it's called uh, Professor uh, Prof. Period Raymond Narag, and okay. they could reach, reach me there. Uh, our website is press uh, www.preso.org. Mm -hmm. That's another one. Or they could reach me in my uh, SIU email address. 
at uh, rnarag at siu.edu. Awesome. Well, yeah. Raymond, it's been a pleasure. I know you have things to do, so we're going to oh, go yeah. ahead and wrap it up <laughs> and, uh, and get off, man. But thank you so All much right. for coming on. And good Thanks, luck with everything time. you've been working on. Yeah, and if you need more information, just uh, shoot me an email and I will be... I'm on sabbatical leave. I'm not teaching right now. Okay. That's why uh, it's also an opportune time for me to start this uh, project. Well, I have no doubt that with everything you've been through and your perseverance that you'll, you'll come out of it just fine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank no you. problem, man. Uh, good luck All with right. everything and uh, let's keep in touch. Okay, okay. Yes, yes. And yeah, hopefully we could see each other face to face. I'm going to visit you in your offices, guys. Okay, sounds good, man. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Man. All right, bye-bye now. Bye.